jerks who are doing things that are offensive. And, and I think our first reaction is to say, what is this? This is a holy book. I think we have to remember though that the Bible is not a story about good people teaching us how to be good. The, story, the Bible is a story about God essentially saving bad people, saving broken people, saving people from themselves in many ways. And so it's sort of funny because I used to be really offended by that stuff, but then I started thinking, oh my gosh, these people are just like me. Like, I am a jerk and I do stupid things and I need to be saved from myself. And so when I look at the Bible and I see people betraying each other and I see people, you know, sinning and I see people doing offensive things, I think, okay, maybe this is a God who can deal with people like me too. Because the Bible is accessible. The Bible is showing me real human beings. Um, and the Bible is ultimately pointing not to humans teaching us how to be good, but about what God has done to save people by His grace who otherwise could never be saved. And so I think that's one way to think about um, all the offensive things that we see in the Bible is that they aren't necessarily being advocated. They're not being taught. They're not being sanctioned. If anything, uh, it, God is demonstrating that these are things that we need to be saved from. These are human beings who are just like us in need of grace. <coughs> It's a great perspective. You know, the message of the Bible, the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a story about redemption. It's a story about a creator who loves his creation so much that he redeems us out of our own filth, out of our own brokenness and out of our own hopelessness and despair. It's not a list of uh, do's and don'ts. It's actually far more than that. It's, it's a true story about love and grace and redemption. And as we just heard in the video, the story is full of all sorts of colorful characters who do all sorts of crazy things out of their own brokenness and hopelessness and despair. In fact, it, if you think about it, it sounds a lot like our world today, which it is, of course, because although human culture constantly changes, human nature never changes. People are people. And so the same brokenness and dysfunction that existed in human beings in centuries past still exists in people today. The details of our circumstances may be different. The, the setting may be different. The culture may be different. But the underlying brokenness that is at the core of our own dysfunction is exactly the same. Which means that the solution that was needed for those broken lives then is the same solution that is needed for broken lives now, which is why the Bible happens to be as relevant today as ever, no matter how ancient those stories may be, because humanity's greatest need never, ever, ever changes. People are broken because of sin, and there has only ever been one cure, and that is the love and grace and forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ alone. And so, Although costly, the answer to what ails humanity is not complicated, right? Religious people and religious leaders in particular over the centuries have tried their best to make it complicated, but it is not. Which is why we should pay very close attention to the way that Jesus addresses brokenness and sin uh, in this gospel story. He had such an extraordinary ability whenever religious people tried to complicate situations in other people's lives. Jesus had an uncanny ability to cut right to the heart of the issue and then offer a very simple solution to the brokenness in people's lives, which is what Christians really should be known for today. Honestly, we, we should be versed in communicating the gospel in a clear, straightforward, and honest way, uncluttered by the trappings of religious culture that church leaders have attached to the gospel message throughout the ages. And uh, I'm not talking, by the way, about being shallow or flippant toward people when they encounter real problems or hurt. Sometimes life presents struggles and situations that are legitimately complicated. And we should always approach the reality of those circumstances with understanding patience and willingness to walk with people through their hurt in order to help them overcome and ultimately move beyond that brokenness to a place of healing. And yet at the same time, when we look at how Jesus handled people and the difficult situations that they were facing, 
he tended to offer very simple and direct solutions that involved a very clear and, and usually a very radical response to that brokenness in their own lives. He, he consistently called people to abandon whatever it was that they were living for and instead follow him, which is a costly calling to be sure, not only because of what he gave up for us, but because of what we are expected to give up for him. So there most certainly is a cost associated with following Jesus Christ. And anyone that tells you any different is either ignorant of the truth or they're trying to sell you something because there's a cost associated with following Jesus Christ. But it is not complicated. And so today we're going to talk about the simple beauty and radical calling of the gospel with one of the more recognizable stories in the Bible as we continue our sermon series, The Gospel According to John. As always, we'll be picking up right where we left off last time. So we're going to finish out the last verse of chapter 7 this morning and work our way through uh, the first 11 verses of chapter 8. And this story is such a tremendous expression of the gospel in action. First of all, it highlights the, the beautiful simplicity of the gospel, but it also illustrates the radical calling of that same gospel as Jesus is confronted with a situation that on the surface appears to be a very uh, complicated predicament with no clear solution until he quite deftly reduces this whole scenario down to a simple choice. It's just brilliant. And so my hope for us today as we explore this story together is that we learn from Jesus how to focus in every situation on the simplicity of the message that we're supposed to be living out in front of others every day, while at the same time being honest with people concerning the outcome, the result of actually living out that gospel, which is a thoroughly radical way to live your life, okay? So let's see what we can glean from the story of the woman who was caught in adultery and then consequently brought to Jesus. And depending upon what uh, translation you have of the Bible, you may notice that this story is either missing from the text in your version or it may be included in the footnotes, uh, might even be in a different location in John or even in the book of Luke in your Bible. The reason is that the earliest manuscripts that we have to the book of John don't contain this story. And although there are some who have tried to make the case that it therefore should not be included in the Bible at all, uh, there have been some of those. However, the, the overwhelming consensus of textual critics is that this account of the woman caught in adultery is authentic, uh, even if not an original part of John's Gospel. <clears throat> it is apostolic, and it should therefore be included in the New Testament text. And so, whether you have it here or in your footnotes, some have uh, versions have it after Luke 21, 38. You might find it there. Uh, while some place the story in various other parts of John, it fits here quite well because it conveys the same type of antagonism toward Jesus by the Pharisees and the scribes that we've been seeing in the previous chapters we've been working our way through. And of course, we'll have it up here on the screen as well so you can follow along uh, if you can't find it in your, in your Bible. So let's pick up the story at the very end of chapter 7, verse 53, and then we'll continue through the first two verses of chapter 8. It says, They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So Jesus would often confound people with his teaching. And if you read this passage in the original Greek, that is the sense here, after the, the debacle the Feast of Tabernacles that we went through a couple of weeks ago where the authorities were unable to silence him. They each go their separate ways and Jesus, as he would do, went to the Mount of Olives to rest, to sleep and to spend a quiet time with the Father before re-entering public ministry. And then after a time of rest, he goes back to the temple and he begins to teach again. So let's keep reading uh, verses 3 through the first half of verse 6. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. That's a key phrase. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge 
to bring against him. Now, if your goal was to put Jesus in a seemingly impossible, very complicated, <laughs> sort of no-win situation by presenting what appeared to be uh, this, this scenario that happened by random, which is exactly, by the way, what these scribes and Pharisees were attempting to do, then, then they've done a masterful job at doing just that, except for the fact that it was Jesus that they were confronting. If, if you think you can pick a fight with God and win, you're barking up the wrong tree, but they hadn't figured that out yet. So they, they definitely get an A for effort because for anyone else, this would have surely been an impossible situation, all right? They, they come to Jesus with this woman under the guise that she's been randomly caught in the act of adultery. And yet, when you realize the standard of evidence that had to be met to prove a capital offense in first century Jewish culture, it becomes fairly obvious that this was not only a setup for Jesus, but it was an elaborate scheme that must have required quite a bit of, of forethought and planning and even timing to not only try and frame Jesus in this impossible situation, but also to use this woman as an unknowing pawn in their plan. Okay, first of all, the, the penalty for adultery at the time was execution. But execution by stoning was only specified for those who were engaged or betrothed to be married and then committed adultery during that time. That was prescribed in uh, Deuteronomy 22, 22 through 24. So to bring a woman to Jesus for public stoning, which is what they were doing, meant that they had to have caught someone who was engaged, who just happened to be engaged to be married, who was also committing adultery. Secondly, uh, in order for the charges to be presented, they had to be, uh, there had to be at least two witnesses who had to agree perfectly in their testimony as to what they actually observed firsthand for themselves, which means they had to have actually seen the sexual act taking place it wasn't enough to see two people leaving the same room together or even lying on the same bed together. The actual act of adultery being committed in that moment had to be witnessed by two or more people at the same time so that they could testify to the same crime. And of course, the difficulty with that is the fact that people didn't commit adultery in public. Right? This was a crime committed privately, which is, by the way, the reason that it was almost never proven in Jesus' day, even when people were suspected or known for it, because it was nearly impossible to prove, let alone with two or more witnesses observing the crime while it was taking place. It was just unheard of. It didn't happen. Thirdly, the punishment for adultery was death for both the man and woman, which is described in, in both Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22. And since the accusers state in verse 4 here that they caught the woman in the act, of adultery, which they would have had to, in order to even bring these charges against her, it means that the man who was committing adultery with her was caught as well, right? They, they witnessed both of them. So why isn't he presented to Jesus alongside her? Something very deceiving was taking place. In fact, many scholars believe that the man who was committing adultery with her was probably a part of this plan from the beginning, which would explain how they knew when and where to barge in or to sneak in to a private residence and witness the act of adultery taking place, it would also explain why he wasn't being brought before Jesus here and publicly accused with the woman. So you have this woman then who's engaged to be married, who's caught by multiple people in the act of committing adultery, brought alone to Jesus, conveniently while he's teaching at the temple, where there were many people to witness what the scribes and Pharisees were convinced would be his undoing. In his commentary about this passage of Scripture, Bible scholar James Montgomery Boyce wrote, Under these conditions, the obtaining of evidence in adultery would be almost impossible were the situation not a setup. And so here is Jesus, standing in front of a lot of people, as these religious leaders and experts in the law have most likely created what seemed to be the perfect trap for this woman and for Jesus. And yet, even with the significant amount of planning and timing involved to execute this plan, the true brilliance of their strategy was in their presentation. Okay, The, the scribes were lawyers. We, we often lump the, 
scribes and Pharisees together, two different groups of people. The scribes were lawyers. They were experts in the Old Testament law. And so if anyone could come up with a plan to trap Jesus in a complicated legal problem, it was certainly the scribes. And that is exactly what they did. They, they present this woman to Jesus with presumably what appears to be no good solution for him according to the law. See, Israel was under Roman occupation at the time. And although uh, Romans permitted self-rule to an extent to the nations that they conquered, there was still a limit to what they would allow. And one of those hard and fast limitations was the death penalty. If someone was to be put to death for a crime committed uh, in a Roman province, then they had to be processed through the Roman judicial system first. And the scribes knew that. So if Jesus says, stone the woman, take her out and stone her now, then they can run to the Roman headquarters and accuse Jesus of sanctioning capital punishment without going through the Roman court system. And yet, because these scribes also knew the Mosaic law, they knew that if Jesus said, don't stone her, they could run to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling authority, and accuse him of being a heretic in violation of the law of Moses. So that no matter how Jesus answered the charge against this woman, he appeared to be in very big trouble. It was a brilliant plan, absolutely brilliant plan to Jesus. It was an elaborate setup and they executed it to a T. And now Jesus appears to be in a very precarious, very complicated situation. In fact, the, the only thing that was more brilliant then this well thought out, well executed, very complicated scheme by the scribes and Pharisees was the profoundly simple response by Jesus. Let's keep reading our story. It's the second half of verse 6 through verse 9. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. This passage has been the source of a tremendous amount of speculation over the centuries because everyone wants to know what Jesus is writing on the ground, including me. There have been many theories about that, but two in particular are the most generally accepted by scholars and historians, okay? The ancient Greek word that was normally used when describing someone who was writing something was the word graphene, which just simply meant to write. But in this passage, the Greek word used to describe Jesus writing in the dirt is katagrapho, which was used often to describe the Roman prefects in their act of writing down a record against someone who was charged before sentencing them. And so the significance of that is the fact that during the first century, um, this was a matter of course for the Roman court system. So the theory is that Jesus was mimicking the Roman judges at this point. But instead of writing down the charges against the woman, he was writing down the sins of each of these men who were involved in this elaborate plan against him and against this woman who was caught in adultery so that they could look down and see their own sins being written out in the dirt. Very compelling. The second theory, which was favored by much of the ancient church, and it's actually the one that I lean toward very strongly as well, is that Jesus was writing down Jeremiah 17, 13 on the ground, which we'll read in a moment. The reason, though, that I personally believe that this is more likely is because Jesus, as far as I'm aware, never mimicked or practiced Gentile customs as a matter of course in his life and ministry, particularly when it came to their systems of rule or practice of law. But what he did do constantly as he taught people, as he responded to the religious Jews who were relentlessly trying to trap him, he constantly quoted and referenced Old Testament scripture. In fact, I would challenge you to try and find a passage where Jesus is speaking, where it's not an incidental conversation, where he's actually teaching something significant. And try and, and find one of those where he wasn't either quoting Old Testament passages or at least referencing Old Testament scripture. I mean, when he opened his mouth, he just spoke the word of God constantly. It was a matter of course for him to use the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, especially 
in his responses to the confrontations that he had with the Pharisees. He did it all the time. He would simply respond to them with the Word of God. And so I personally find it much more in step with the character and practice of Jesus that he would respond to them by writing an appropriate passage of Scripture in the dirt with his finger right in front of them. A passage, by the way, that they would have been familiar with, particularly these scribes and Pharisees. And so the most likely candidate here was Jeremiah 17, 13, which says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. You may find in your version it says written in the dust. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Now keep in mind that if he was writing this passage, he was writing it on the earth, in the dust. Instead of writing it, uh, uh, he was writing it before men who were about to turn away from him and forsake him, as the passage says. And this is just after he explained to them that he was the source, the ultimate source of living water, the fountain of living water, which you'll remember from a, two or three weeks ago at the, the, tab, the, the Festival of Tabernacles back in chapter 7. We went over it two or three weeks ago. This was right after that for him. So he says, All who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living water. It is certainly a fitting passage of Scripture for the situation, for him to fulfill even that prophecy. Quoting it here would have been much more in keeping, I believe, with Jesus' usual way of responding to accusations against him. Okay, and either way, whatever he actually wrote, it was initially infuriating to these scribes and Pharisees as they continued to press him for a response. And you can imagine if they're either reading that passage or their own sins, the effect that would have had. But ultimately it was convicting. As he coupled it with this statement, he said, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then we see all the wind taken out of their sails. And the situation is completely diffused because of his, of his response. And the true brilliance of the statement here, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her is the fact that he was not violating the Roman law or the Mosaic law. He was in fact honoring both, which was a scenario that the scribes and Pharisees could never have anticipated. Okay? He didn't order them to stone her on the spot, which kept him from violating Roman law, and yet he didn't say don't stone her either. In fact, quite the opposite. He invited anyone there who was qualified under the Mosaic law to go ahead and satisfy the Mosaic law. Why? Because she was guilty of sin, deserving death. And so he merely points out that they were also guilty of the exact same sin, deserving death. You see, because not only are we, of course, all guilty of sin, deserving eternal judgment, but if these men had indeed created this entire setup to frame Jesus in what seemed to be an impossible situation, then they were just as guilty of this particular crime of adultery as the woman was because they designed and produced the entire event to begin with. And so Jesus doesn't say to them, do not satisfy the law of Moses. What he said was, yes, this woman is deserving of death for her crime. And so whomever is here who is actually not guilty of the crime in question, by all means, be the first one to cast a stone. Which, by the way, happened to be Jesus himself. You see, there was one there who was qualified to cast a stone at her. It was Jesus because he was the only one there without sin. He was the only one there not guilty of this particular sin. And so no one was denying her guilt. Jesus never disputed her guilt. He simply pointed out that they were all complicit in the same crime and therefore they were all deserving of the same punishment. It's amazingly brilliant. And so just as any judge gets to decide what punishment, if any, that a person guilty of a crime receives, Jesus makes a final ruling on this woman when no one else is qualified to do so. It's worth mentioning, by the way, as well, that this woman was the only one among the whole lot with enough guts to not walk away when her sin was called out. All of the cowards who set her up took off as soon as Jesus said, okay, you want justice? Let's talk about justice. Who here is actually not guilty of this sin, which calls for a death sentence? 
And they all funnel out in a line one by one, except this woman. She alone stays with Jesus, which we should be careful not to overlook here. Because once again, he proves out his earlier claim in John 6, 37, where he now says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Is this woman rejected by the religious culture of her day, rejected by society, she was broken by sin and lost in hopelessness, stands before the Christ, and hears the most profoundly beautiful and simple words that any person could ever hope to hear from God himself. Let's keep reading. Verse 10 through the first half of verse 11. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. You see, the, the effect of the gospel in our lives is profoundly beautiful and quite simple. We bring our brokenness, all of our sin, all of our mess to Christ in an instant. He grants us our freedom from all of it. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now just think about all of those men who walked away when confronted with their own sin. What if they had stayed as the woman caught in adultery did? But they chose to walk away instead. You see, he, he won't ever make you stay. But all who come to Him, no matter how bad your life may be, if you but come to Him, He says that He will never cast you out. Why? Because there is no condemnation when we are in Him. This is so powerfully and beautifully simple. And yet as Jeremiah said, those who turn away from you shall be written in the dust. For they have forsaken the Lord. If they just stay, if they just come to Him with humility, recognizing their absolute need for a Savior, a Messiah, the outcome would have been very different for them. You see, because the gospel isn't complicated. It's actually quite simple. And, and, and all that it requires of us is that we come to Him in faith. And in humility, we submit our lives to His Lordship. And in that moment, He says to us, Neither do I condemn you. The death sentence is lifted. And you are free. There's no other requirement in that moment. And so as believers, and particularly, listen, particularly as a religious leader, I'm speaking to myself here, we have to stop adding other requirements to the true path to freedom. We don't need to muddy the waters or complicate the process for people. Now, now listen, the gospel, the gospel is a radical calling. And that requires much of us, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the freedom that we receive, the stay of execution, the denial of condemnation that we deserve, that requires nothing from us other than a coming to Jesus in faith. And in that moment, we are granted freedom in Him. There is not one single thing that we can do, not one achievement, not a shred of effort that could ever earn us that freedom. That is such a simple and yet profound gift from God that He gives us when we simply come to Him. And that should be a very clear and uncluttered message on our lips when we talk to the lost in this world. Just come to Jesus. He will grant you freedom from the sin that enslaves us all when we live without Him. That's the simplicity and beauty of the Gospel based on what Christ did for us, which we've talked about over the past two weeks. And yet, there is another aspect to this Gospel which is very radical in nature, and that is the calling of the Gospel, which is, by the way, not a prerequisite for our freedom. It is the product of our freedom. In other words, living radically for Christ has nothing to do with earning the gift of salvation because we cannot earn that gift. Living radically for Christ is what we're all called to do because of the freedom that we've already been given when we come to Him. Remember, Paul said, the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. And it is that Spirit within us that has set us free that enables us to now answer the call of the Gospel 
to live radically for him. Notice what Jesus says to the woman caught in adultery who has just experienced her newfound freedom in him. And we'll finish our text with this today. The last half of verse 11, he says, go and from now on sin no more. Well, that sounds like to us an obvious thing for Jesus to say, and I suppose it is, but to really grasp the weight of what he's saying, we have to understand the radical nature of that calling for this woman to go and from now on sin no more. Because what Jesus did consistently with people was to call them to walk away from whatever it was that they were living for before they came to him and to instead in their new freedom follow him. Which is, by the way, the very definition of repentance. In Mark 1.15, Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The word repent in that verse is the Greek word metaneo. It means to change one's mind. It's, it's the complete reversal of our current path in deference to a completely different path. This is the radical calling of the gospel. To completely change directions. To give up whatever it is that we've been living for. And follow Jesus Christ instead. We see it with the, the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Where Jesus tells this man who has spent his life amassing great possessions to sell it all. Give the money to the poor and follow Jesus. Why did he say that to everyone? Because that's not what everyone is living for. This particular man happened to be. When Moses fled to the desert for 40 years living for himself. Away from his responsibility to his people. What does God do? He calls him back to Egypt to lead his people out and spend the rest of his life living for others. In Philippians 3, after describing all of the things that he'd obtained and gained in this life, all of the things that he'd lived for, the Apostle Paul says, but I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. It's a complete and radical reversal of his life, of what he'd been living for in the preceding chapters of John, we witness Jesus continually challenging the religious leaders to look to him as their supply instead of the law, which is what they've been living for. And of course, in Luke 14, 33, which we've read many times here, Jesus says, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. <coughs> and so when we look at this woman this adulteress, this is probably someone who was known in that community to be a person who had practiced adultery before, maybe even someone with a strong reputation for it, because it's doubtful that they would have set up this entire plan, try and set up a woman who was known to be pure, God-fearing, devoted to her fiancé kind of woman, knowing their chances of catching her in the act of adultery would be so much less than an individual who was already known in the community as an adulteress. And so Jesus says to this woman, who had probably given her life over to adultery, he says, go and from now on sin no more. Well, I doubt this was a, a general call for her to try and be better, to try and live a, a bit more of a moral life, to try and not sin in general. I think Jesus was saying to her, go and stop living as you have been. Go and radically change your lifestyle from the only life that you've ever known, which is a life of adultery, to one that honors me. In other words, give up the thing that you've been living for and follow me instead. And you can bet that for this woman, that was a radical calling to completely change her life, which she could only do because of her newfound freedom in him. True repentance is a complete reversal from our previous way of life to following Christ. And that will always lead you down a radical path. This is where I fear, to be honest with you, that much of the church today has fallen short. I'm afraid that the church is all about proclaiming the neither do I condemn you part, as we should be. But then I think we all too often stop there. We don't always follow through with that last bit, the part where we devote the rest of our lives to radically following Christ because I think we're afraid of turning people off or driving them away or heaping too much on them. But listen, we cannot leave that last part out because the radical calling of the gospel is for all of us who come to Him 
the way that we live the rest of our lives is not what brings us to Him. It's what brings others to Him. You see, when we follow Christ by honoring Him and living radically for Him wherever that leads us throughout life, we attest to the rest of the world that what we say we believe in is actually true because they see it being lived out in our lives. They think too much of the church is falling short on this. And since some of Jesus' final instructions to his followers was to go and make disciples of all nations, I'd say this radically following Jesus thing is about as important as it gets. So we can't leave that last part out. We cannot stop short after sharing the simple beauty of the gospel with others by not telling them the rest of it. The part where the gospel calls us to a radical life, spent, in, and I mean spent, following Jesus with all that we have, everything that we are, every ounce of everything that He's given us that we muster in service to Him. That isn't normal for most people. I'm not sure that's normal for most Western Christians today. We preach a comfortable gospel. Jesus never really called anyone to easy. In His Word, read about His followers. It's a radical calling. We need to tell people that with honesty. And of course, once we tell people that, we better be actually living it out ourselves. The lost in this world need to hear the truth. They need to hear the simple, beautiful, uncluttered truth of the gospel. And then they need to see us living that out radically right in front of them. <coughs> that is what will cause the church, and I don't just mean this church, I mean, that is what will cause the church of Jesus Christ to explode with new growth. It has nothing to do with lights or speakers or styles or systems or structures. It has everything to do with people living out publicly what they claim they believe. A profoundly simple and beautiful gospel that calls us to live radically. For Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the freedom that you grant each of us when we simply come to you. We submit our lives to you. We, we turn away from our previous life repentance. We live for you. We're so grateful that you don't expect or require us to somehow earn that freedom as we know now. We never could do that. So we ask you to help us with all compassion and grace and love to share that simple beautiful truth of this gospel with the lost that we encounter in our lives. We ask that the message would be clear that all we need to do is come to Him, come to Jesus with all of our hurt and all of our sin and all of our shamefulness, that we can simply come to Him in faith and He will grant us freedom from all of it. And then, Father, we ask You to help us not only to share that truth, but to actually live out the radical calling of that same gospel in front of others, that they would see us they would see our utter devotion to you. That they would understand the undeniable truth of that message because of the evidence of it in our own lives. So right now in this moment, we just take a moment to devote ourselves once again to you, to the radical calling of your gospel. You, you, you call each one of us to something different we know that looks different for each person because you created each of us to fulfill a specific purpose within your body. You've given us individual gifts and talents, inclinations. You've given us different resources and different sets of skills. So the calling looks a bit different for each of us. Whatever it is, 
whatever it is for each one. We devote ourselves to it now. Radically devote ourselves to following you. Wherever you choose to lead us in, whatever it looks like and however you accomplish that in our lives. And so we thank you for this gospel and that part in it that you've created for each of us. We trust you to help us to make the most of it. Even as we pray now in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, I love you guys. I mean it. I love you very much. And I'm very grateful that you're here and that we get to do this together. I can't wait to see you next Sunday. Uh, or even maybe Wednesday night at a community group. Have a really blessed week. I love you. You're dismissed.